So one day I'm minding my own business, toasting some marshmallows by the light of a handy sulfur fume roll, when I thought to myself, you know what I should do today? I should go and investigate a really creepy abandoned research base. And so that's what I did. Okay, so that's not precisely how it happened. I'd headed back to the crashed Thargoid ship that we saw in a previous video, where I was collecting some Thargoid sensor fragments. Because it's not just Professor Palin that required them, there's another engineer goes by the name of Chloe Sedaisy. And while I don't absolutely need access to Chloe Sedaisy, I'm a bit of a completionist. Uh, she provides Grade 5 access to thruster upgrades, which is nice, but she's not the only engineer who offers this. And thanks to a process known as remote engineering, it's useful to have multiple options. You see, the way it works is when you visit an engineer directly, you can pick one of the engineering upgrades that they offer and pin it. And a pinned upgrade becomes available through the remote engineering facilities in any space station. So that's fantastic. It means you don't have to travel all the way back to the engineer anytime you want to apply that one specific pinned engineering blueprint to whichever ship you happen to be flying. And you can pin one blueprint from each engineer. So, let's say for example I have two engineers and I've unlocked Grade 5 access with both of them. One of them's Chloe Sedaisy and I get Grade 5 access to thrusters from her as well as Grade 3 access to frameshift drives. Not particularly useful because I already have Felicity Farseer giving me Grade 5 access to frameshift drives. But there's another engineer who goes by the name of Mel Brandon who as well as offering Grade 5 thruster upgrades also offers Grade 5 frameshift drives shield generators, burst pulse and beam lasers, frameshift drive interdictors, and grade 5 shield boosters. Now that is a big selection of very useful upgrades. But you can only pick one of them to pin and use in remote engineering. So if you have access to other engineers who offer, for example, grade 5 thrusters, hello there Chloe Sedaisy, I'm looking at you, I can pin thrusters with her, and then I can pick something more exclusive from the other engineers who offer the same things. There are downsides to remote engineering, of course. If, for example, I visit an engineer in person and uh, purchase upgrades from them, that increases the level of access that I enjoy with that particular engineer. That's not something that happens with remote engineering. If I've pinned a level 3 blueprint, for example, then level 3 is the highest that I can take it. If I want to increase the access to level 4 or 5, I have to visit the engineer in person. Remote engineering also doesn't allow you to tinker with the various different experimental options on the upgrades that are available. For that, again, you have to visit the engineering person. But the remote engineering process is still very, very useful. Uh, quite early on, I unlocked Grade 5 access to frameshift drives through Felicity Farseer. Now, it would be a colossal pain in the arse if every time I bought a new ship and I wanted to upgrade the frameshift drive, I had to travel all the way back to see Felicity Farseer, but thanks to remote engineering, I don't have to do that. What does any of this, Jingles, have to do with exploring creepy abandoned research bases? Oh, absolutely nothing. But in the process of collecting another 25 Thargoid sensor fragments for Chloe Sedaisy, who requires 25 of them, just like Professor Palin, and also requires that you've travelled at least 5,000 light years from your career start point, but we've covered that. I happened across a signal on the same planet as the crashed Thargoid ship where we get those sensor fragments from. And I thought it was worth checking out. There is some kind of research base inside this big old impact crater. I'm going to be cautious because, well, I've come across a lot of these surface installations out in the middle of nowhere. They get very touchy if you breach their perimeter and start shooting at you. And they also sometimes have patrols flying around and there are two other ships down there although one of them is a type 7 transporter and it's probably not a patrol ship because if you're gonna pick something to guard a perimeter a type 7 transporter is probably not it there's an adder down there as well and they just seem to be flying circles around the research base which has a very, very unhealthy sort of green glow around it. Well, the two ships flying perimeter don't seem to care that I'm here. But before I put down, I'm going to do a slow circle of the perimeter 
I'm going to do a Corporal Ferro. One internet brownie point to anybody who gets that reference. And I'm not getting shot at. And there doesn't really seem to be anything active down there. And since the guys flying perimeter don't seem to care that I'm here, I think we're going to put down and investigate in greater detail in the surface reconnaissance vehicle. And we are down. Okay. I have to admit, all of that sickly looking Nurgle rot type green shit over there is really not giving me a warm fuzzy feeling in the pit of my stomach. But I'm not going to find out anything by sitting in the cockpit of my asp. Oh yeah, system link error, security response unavailable. Hmm. So that means two things. One, if I get into the shit here, the cavalry aren't going to be coming to my rescue. If those two ships circling overhead decide, just for shits and giggles, to start shooting up my SRV, or even my parked ship, nobody's going to come to help. And they technically won't even be committing a crime, because there are no laws here for them to break. All the ships in this system, me, the Adder, and the Type 7 Transporter, have the security status of lawless, which means anything that happens between us stays between us. Security services don't care, because there are no security services here. There's nobody to report a crime to. I am slightly more concerned about all that green shit up ahead. It looks a bit Thargoidy to me. Do you remember when I got hyperdicted a couple of episodes back, when the Thargoids dragged me out of hyperspace, took a quick shifty, and then buggered off? When they buggered off, the frameshift wake was surrounded by a cloud of green corrosive, well, you know, shit, like this. So if anything starts eating away at the hull of my SRV, I'm going to be get the hell out of here. I think I must be inside the cloud now, though. And other than filtering everything green, it doesn't seem to be having any effect. Also, if those other two ships were here to enforce any kind of perimeter, they would have started shooting at me by now, so... I appear to be relatively safe. So what is this place? I mean, what's going on here? Oh, hang on, I have a contact. I have a couple of contacts. One, two, three, four contacts. So one of these. Oh, one shield emitters. That's a, that's an engineering component. I'll have them. It's not the only thing that's here, though. I mean, there are some low-grade engineering materials scattered around this place, but it's the research lab data logs that are the important thing about this place. There are four of these settlement data log uplinks, and once you've downloaded the data from each of them, all four of them together, tell the story of what exactly it was that happened here. We've secured a specimen. One of our suppliers purchased the probe on the black market. It was expensive, but worth it. This thing is magnificent. It's sitting in the containment unit now. We're keeping it on a gurney made from meta-alloy to prevent any damage to the lab. It's not a perfect solution, but at least it hasn't eaten through the floor. Tomorrow, I'm going to find out exactly what makes this thing tick. The probe is organic in appearance, but seems to possess many inorganic properties. The outer casing is made of elements we have been unable to identify. Thus far, radiocarbon testing has proved inconclusive. Attempts to dissect the outer carapace with a conventional scalpel have also been unsuccessful. We simply don't have a blade that can pierce the shell. I am now proceeding with electro-cauterization. I'm 
must say this is fascinating. Upon making my primary incision, the probe emitted an electromagnetic pulse that shut down the entire laboratory and most of the research facility. Luckily, auxiliary power kicked in and kept our life support online. If it hadn't, we might have found ourselves a little short of air. The tech team has restored power to the main systems, but most of my hardware has been destroyed. Cargo scoop retracted. Great. My examinations will have to be put on hold until the equipment can be replaced or repaired. Who knows how long that will take. There is one curious thing, though. Since it released the pulse, the probe has been emitting a constant signal. We have no idea what it's trying to communicate. But comms have assured me they have their best cryptographer on the job. have been initiated. Whatever's assaulting us has systematically taken the settlement apart. We try to hail it to show them we mean no harm, but there's no answer. I've been given the order to evacuate. I'm leaving a ton of research behind, but there's no time to upload it to the mainframe. I just hope we can get out of here before the whole... Yep. I think the lesson here is don't fuck with the Thargoids. Anyway, I've got my 25 cents of fragments. I've travelled more than 5,000 light years from my career start position. It's time to go and see Chloe Sedacy, who is located here at Cinder Dock on Planet A6 in the Shenbei system. Now, here's a little tip. If, like me, in this particular situation, you've arrived at a new engineer, you unlock access, but you don't actually have enough of the specific engineering materials that that engineer requires to apply the upgrades to your ship, in this case my thrusters, in order to unlock full grade 5 access. You've got three choices. You can either go away and spend quite some time farming the specific materials that you require, or you can find a station with a material trader and trade for the specific materials that you require, or you can check to see whether or not that particular engineer's station comes with a universal cartographics office, because remember when I was basically buying reputation with a Sirius Corporation by dumping pages and pages of cartographics data on them to boost my standing with them? It's exactly the same thing with the engineers, because the engineers are the controlling faction of the settlements in which they live. And you can increase your access with the engineers by selling them cartographic data in exactly the same way that you can increase your reputation with the orbital stations faction by selling them cartographic data. Not all of the engineers have universal cartographics offices though, but Chloe here does. And navigational data is a lot easier to get your hands on than engineering materials, so it does pay to keep a stock of this stuff in your data bank just in case you need to raise your reputation or level of access with someone very, very quickly. And in the process, it appears, I have just achieved the exploration rank of Ranger, which is about damn time, and also very nice. So, I'm done with Chloe, but I was really only interested in Chloe Sadezi as a backup, because all of the services that she offers I've already unlocked from Professor Palin in the previous episode. And speaking of tying up loose ends, that's why you currently find me here in the HR6836 system, docking at the Townsend City Orbital. Although the choice of system and orbital is mostly irrelevant, it just has to be some place that sells gold. Because I've unlocked access to Lei Chung, who offers Grade 5 access to shield generator upgrades, which is going to be very useful. And he required that I have traded in at least 50 separate markets, which is why Every time I docked somewhere, I was buying something cheap and inexpensive and just selling it at the next place that I docked, regardless of whether or not it actually earned me a profit. Because the object of the exercise was just to trade in 50 separate markets. It wasn't to make a profit in 50 separate markets, which is why I was picking something cheap. So if I did make a loss, it was going to be minuscule. But why gold? Well, as well as trading in 50 separate markets, Lei Chung also wants you to deliver him 200 tonnes of the shiny yellow stuff. Yes, Lei Chung is in love with the almighty dollar. 
All hail the almighty dollar. And uh, 200 tons of the shiny yellow stuff, well, you're not going to see an awful lot of change out of 2 million credits for that. There are four different ways you can get your hands on that amount of gold. You could try mining for the stuff, but that would take forever. Although it would help towards unlocking access to Celine Jean, another engineer who requires that you have mined at least 500 tons of all different types of ore, but seriously, fuck that. Now, it's far more convenient to just buy it. Now, you could just fly from system to system until you happen across a station that sells gold on the commodity market, or you could use your galaxy map to find a system that has an extraction-based economy that's far more likely to actually have gold in stock, or you can just head over to the Elite Dangerous database, plug in your current location, and let the database tell you where the nearest stock of gold is, which is what I did here. That concluded its next stop, the Trader's Rest Settlement on Planet A6 in the Laxax system, the home of Lei Chung. Hand over, begrudgingly, your 200 tonnes of gold, and Lei Chung will begin work, well, amongst other things, most particularly your shield generators. That's not all he does. He can also fully tune your sensors and your surface scanners, but is the only engineer I've come across so far that offers full Grade 5 access to shield generators, so that is definitely the blueprint that I'm going to be first working on and then pinning with him so I can use remote engineering to apply shield generator upgrades to all of my other ships without having to physically come out here and get him to do it personally. As far as specific shields upgrades go, I'm going to go with the thermal resistant effect uh, because laser weapons are what do the most damage to shields and they apply thermal damage, so it makes sense to give the shields thermal resistance. And it'll probably come as no great surprise to anybody that improving your access to Lei Chung by having him apply those engineering upgrades also unlocks yet another engineer. This one is called Ram Tar. And I have to admit, I, I wasn't getting too excited about Ram Tar once I checked him out. I mean, he does have Grade 5 access to a whole bunch of things and Grade 4 access to a whole bunch of other things, but the things that he offers are not particularly essential. Things like electronic countermeasures, point defences, heat sink launchers, chaff launchers, collect Olympic controllers, fuel transfer Olympic controllers. I mean, you know, you get the idea. Useful, I suppose, but not exactly essential. If only I'd known how important Ramtar was going to be much, much further down the line when it comes to researching Guardian technology, but that's an entirely different kettle of fish that we will be getting into at some point in the future, just not today. But anyway, we're now done with Lei Chung. So what's next? Well, next is Celine Jean. Now, we got access to Celine Jean by ranking up Todd McQuinn in the last episode, and Celine Jean is going to be a bit of a pain in the arse. She is going to require that we have mined and refined at least 500 tons of ore, and for a lot of people who've been doing low temperature diamond mining exclusively for the last couple of months, that's probably not going to be a problem, but for me it is. So there's a lot more mining going to be happening in my immediate future, not least of which because Celine Jean also requires a very specific 10 tons of painite ore. Now there's an opportunity here, once again, for us to kill multiple birds with one stone here. Since we're going to be doing a lot of mining, what other engineers are going to require specific minerals? Well, gaining access to Celine Jean is going to lead to an engineer who goes by the name of Bill Turner, and he's going to want 50 tons of bromelite ore. And remember Marsha Hicks, who we unlocked in the last episode? She's also going to want 10 tons of osmium. So while we're mining the remainder of the 500 tons of ore of any type that we're going to need to open access to Celine Jean, it'd be a good idea to mine 50 tons of bromelite, 10 tons of painite, and 10 tons of osmium. Now at this point, if you haven't already, and I have, and if you've been following my progress and doing the same thing, you will have too, but if you haven't, it'd be a very good idea to head over to the 78 Ursae Majoris system and get yourself allied with the Alioth Independence Faction, because Bill Turner is located in the Alioth system, which is a restricted system, you require a permit to enter it, and that permit will be supplied by the Alioth Independence once you reach allied status with them. Bill Turner also requires that you have at least friendly status with the Alliance Power Block. It's the Alliance Power Block. Well, there are three major power blocks in the world of Elite. The Empire and the Federation, 
and the Alliance. Well, I'll say the Alliance is the third major power block. I mean, technically that's true, but they're the third major power block in the way that... Well, imagine that the Federation or the US Army and the Empire or the US Navy. The Alliance of the US Coast Guard. I mean, yes, they get invited to the Joint Chiefs of Staff meetings, but nobody really cares if they turn up or not, and if they do turn up, nobody really listens to what they have to say. Nevertheless, Bill Turner is going to require that you are at least friendly with them, which shouldn't be too much of a problem if you've been trading in or running missions from Alliance-dominated stations. What follows, however, is going to be a bit of a drag. Equip a ship for mining, find a planet that has a metallic ring, not an icy ring, Icy rings are where low-temperature diamonds live. No, you're going to need a planet with a metallic ring, because metallic asteroids are where you're going to find the painite and the osmium that Celine Jean and Marsha Hicks both need. Once you have your 10 units of painite and your 10 units of osmium, you're going to go looking for an icy ring, because that's where you're going to find the 50 tons of bromelite that Bill Turner is going to require. And you're going to keep mining until you have the 10 tons of painite, the 10 tons of osmium, the 50 tons of bromelite, and you'll know when you've mined out the full 500 tons of any type of ore that you require, because as soon as that happens, you'll get a message from Celine Jean. Do not leave, and do not stop mining, until you've got the 10 tons of painite, 10 tons of osmium, and 50 tons of bromelite. Anything else that you manage to gather along the way, feel free to sell, but keep a hold of the painite, osmium, and bromelite. Once you're done, and only once you're done, we're going to be heading to the settlement of Prospector's Rest on planet B3 in the Cook system. This is where Selene Jean lives. Selene Jean's a very useful engineer to know. I mean, getting access to her was a bit of a pain in the arse. Mining 500 tons of ore is no easy task, but unlike that complete bastard Marco Quent, who gave us an even bigger runaround and didn't actually know anything useful beyond his contact list, Celine Jean offers Grade 5 access to both hull reinforcement packages and armour. And she also, once we've ranked up access to her far enough, provides information on Bill Turner and Didi Vatterman. Didi Vatterman is actually fairly straightforward. The only really difficult thing about making contact with her is getting the invitation in the first place, and we've already done that through ranking up Celine Jean. The only thing that Didi Vatterman requires in addition to that is that you have a trade rank of merchant or higher, and we've easily done that. And she wants us to provide her with 50 units of Lave and Brandy, which you can buy at the orbital station in Lave. Bill Turner, on the other hand, would be a real pain in the arse to access, except we've already completed all of his requirements by following this guide. We've got the 50 tons of Bromelite from unlocking Celine Jean, and we've got access to the Alioth system where he lives, while that git Marco Quent was giving us the runaround. Do you remember our 5,000 light year trip? All of that astro-navigational data was used to basically buy allied status with the Sirius Corporation, giving us access to the Sirius system where Marco lived. But the excess astro-navigational data beyond that required to get allied status with the Sirius Corporation was dumped on a station controlled by the Alioth Independence, gaining us allied status with them and the permit required to access the Alioth system where Bill Turner lives. It all seemed a bit pointless and extraneous to requirements at the time we were doing it, but it's all becoming worthwhile now, because all we now need to do to unlock Bill Turner is just turn up on his doorstep and give him his 50 tons of bromelite. And that's the genius thing about Fox's step-by-step -step guide to unlocking an engineer as quickly. It's the guide that I've been following. It's two years old, it's out of date in some places, it still says that Professor Palin, for example, lives in the Maya system. He doesn't, he's been chased out by the Thargoids since the guide was written, but other than that, it's all still very relevant, and it's... hang on. Why is Turner Metallics Incorporated in red? Okay, it's changed back to orange, but... Okay, that's not a good sign. Let's get a little closer find out what's going on. But the guide is very, very good. I mean, there's a lot of setup in the beginning. We're doing things that didn't really seem like they had any practical relevance. And at the time, they didn't. But they're starting to pay off now. I mean, in this one episode, I've unlocked access to five engineers. Diddy Vatterman, Bill Turner, Celine Jean, Chloe Sadezi, and Lei Chung. 
Now, of course, I just have to land at Turner Metallics Incorporated and hand over my 50 tons of bromelite. Let's request docking clearance. What? Under attack? Auto dock offline? I assure you I'm not under attack. I mean, on the bright side, I have been granted landing clearance. I've been given a pad to land on, but I'm... it's not allowing me to use the docking computer because I'm under attack. Except I'm not under attack. <sighs> it's never simple, is it? <laughs> There's always something. I can't even find my landing pad. There's somebody taken off down there. Looks like a crate. That can't be landing pad 8. It wouldn't have assigned me to it if there was somebody in the process of taking off. God damn it, Bill. I was starting to like you. Why do you have to make it hard? Well, I did eventually find landing pad number 8. Because there's an indicator in the cockpit there that points in the direction of your landing pad. Can you see it? Wait for it. Wait for it. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously, in the canyon, underneath whatever the hell that bridge-like structure is. All of this open ground, for miles in any direction. And that's where Bill thinks it's a good idea to put a fucking landing pad. <laughs> a landing pad for large ships as well. You know, not a little Asp Explorer or Sidewinder that can just zip in, no. This is the large ship landing pad. This is the landing pad for the biggest, most cumbersome ships in the game. The ones that are really going to struggle to fit into narrow, tight and enclosed spaces like this. And I can't let the docking computer do it because apparently I'm under attack. Even though I'm not actually under attack. Fuck you, Bill Turner. <laughs> Although I have to admit, I do at least appreciate his sense of humour. Anyway, we're here. We just have to give him his 50 tons of bromelite, and we can put Bill to work. And it's not been a bad episode, and it's proven the worth of this guide, even if it is two years old, because in the space of one episode, that's five engineers. Bill Turner, Dee Dee Vanderman, Lei Chung, Celine Jean, and Chloe Sadezi. Five engineers. I mean, it took a lot of setup. Mostly when that utter twat Marco Quent was giving us the runaround, and a lot of stuff that we were doing for Marco Quent didn't really seem like it was immediately relevant. And it wasn't at the time, but it's all paying off now. Coming up next, we're going to be providing Dee Dee Vanderman with the 50 units of Lavian Brandy that she wants, which is going to end up being slightly more problematic than it really has any need to be. And then, just when we thought we were done with complete arseholes like Marco Quent, the engineer Liz Ryder is going to be giving us a runaround of epic proportions as well. All that coming up in the next episode. In the meantime, I hope you've enjoyed this one. Hope you're all having a great weekend, and as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.